Well, hello everyone and welcome to another episode here on the Online Gardener channel. I'm really excited for this episode because I'm going to show you all how we unlock the biological potential of our garden, how we grow massive vegetables, how we grow uh, incredible crops that are bigger and better than they are in the grocery store, uh, again, by unlocking the biological potential of your plants. This is something that competition growers talk a lot about and I felt it was a pretty fitting point to talk about biological potential as we're looking at one nasturtium plant. That's right, folks. This plant here is one nasturtium plant. It is approximately five and a half, maybe uh, pushing six feet tall, long, I guess. <laughs> and five and, a half, five and a half feet long and about six and a half feet wide. This is a massive plant and one of the largest nasturtiums I've ever grown. And one of the things that we've done is to start off this episode is we have simulated nature. Um, when you simulate nature and you simulate nature extremely well, the plant, it's, it's reduced on stress. If a stressed plant, um, well, if a plant is under stress, it's not going to grow as well because it's going to be spending energy fighting that stress. So one of the things we've done is we've watered on a regular basis. Watering will help reduce stress because the plant uses water in its leaves and if it's wilted it can't uh, photosynthesize the same that it could um, had it been well watered. So having nice firm leaves. Another thing we've done is by keeping it disease free. Um, nasturtiums, are, they're relatively disease free. I don't know many diseases that plague them, but on a plant like uh, zucchini or tomatoes or cucumbers, for instance, that are a little more prone to disease, um, keeping them disease free, blight free, powdery mildew free, that's very important because when they're battling those diseases, they're not able to focus on fruit production and growth. So you're not going to have the genetic potential that, uh, that they would, or exceeding the genetic potential that they would ha had they been disease free. Another thing that we've done is we fertilize on a very regular basis. So many times people just assume that your, your garden is going to have all the nutrients that it needs in the beginning of the year and it's kind of just a one-stop shop, throw in some compost and you're done. However, what we've done is we've gone, we've added compost, we've added the rock dust, we've added uh, worm castings. We've also gone through and we've also added Trifecta Plus in the very beginning of the year. And let me tell you that that is not without its benefits. Um, when you keep lots of nutrients in the soil, sometimes a lot of times people say, I don't want to over, I don't want to over fertilize. I'm worried about over fertilization of my plants. And so many people are worried about that. They're concerned about um, maybe some negative side effects of over fertilization. And I can say this with certainty that I have never seen a negative side effect from fertilizing twice with an organic fertilizer. And that's the secret, is an organic fertilizer, folks. If you're using a synthetic fertilizer, you can in fact burn the roots. You can in fact give them too much nitrogen. But the fact is, when you're growing in an organic setting, this is 100% organic, mind you, and this is the largest nasturtium I've ever seen. In fact, I shared a picture uh, online and someone said that I should submit this plant into, a, uh, into Guinness Book of World Records because they've never seen a nasturtium plant this large. So. I'll be contacting them. I don't know what they'll say, but, but I'll contact them. Um, because the fact of the matter is this is coming from one plant right in the center of this bed. And it's grown into this massive mounding uh, plant here. And that's because I've fertilized on a regular basis. I've fertilized twice with trifecta. I've added compost three times throughout the season. I've followed up uh, twice with worm castings and once with azomite. And so I've, I've been diligent to fertilize uh, my plants. And that's one thing that I've done is because if there is a nutrient deficiency, I'd rather not let my plants tell me. See what I'm saying? By the time they've told me, they're clearly stressed. And what we talked about stress in the beginning is that if your plants are stressed, they're not going to be able to focus as much energy on, uh, on growing and producing fruit or flowers or things like that. Um, and also it will decrease the size of the fruit and flowers that you do have. So again, it's very, very important to maintain nutrient levels in your soil. It's just incredible to see all the honeybees on these plants. I mean, I can count six or seven on these flowers and it's awesome to see because we don't have any honeybee hives. So they're clearly coming from someplace and I'm just glad they're finding a home or finding a food source to take back to their home so they uh, can hopefully survive. It's awesome to see. So um, yeah, 
I love it. They're, it's one of their last pollen sources because not many flowers are flowering this time of year. So very cool. Um, but back on the topic, back on the topic about what I was talking about, um, which is another thing that we've done to make sure the plant is stressed or not stressed and able to grow to its full genetic potential is by selecting a variety that grows well in our area. Now, some varieties will grow well in any area. For instance, this is part of a jewel mix nasturtium and it's just a regular orange nasturtium. I don't necessarily know if this variety uh, grows well in all areas, but I know for a fact that the orange one has grown very well for us every single year we've ever grown it and it grows bountifully because um, our climate is, is very good for this variety of nasturtium. And it might not be as good of an example as let's say an apple. If you're growing an apple tree and you're living on the East Coast, let's say Fuji is a very good apple for you on the East Coast. I'm not sure if it is or not. I'm not on the East Coast. Um, I'll speak, okay, you know what? Here, here's, for Michigan, a very good apple is Summer Crisp. It's a very reliable apple. It's a lot, what a lot of orchards will grow uh, primarily around here because Summer Crisp is uh, it's just a very good apple for this, for this specific region. If we were to take something like a Gala or I guess a Granny Smith or something like that, the conditions might be enough to survive, but the conditions are not as great as if you had have uh, planted the, the Gala or the Granny Smith in, let's say, Washington, which is in a totally different part of the United States. It's a totally different climate, a totally different uh, rainfall, winters, everything like that all plays into effect. And if you're growing a variety that's not as good for your area as another variety, you're going to sh see some signs of stress. And again, that stress is what sets the plant back and does not allow it to produce as well or, uh, or to, to thrive to what it could normally be. So all these things are so important to take into account. And I do recommend you doing your research as well as taking the steps to maintaining the, the, the health of your plant. And oh, and one last thing that I wanted to talk about is, grow your, is by growing the plant in the time of year that it grows best. For instance, lettuce. If you're trying to grow lettuce in the summer, it's not going to do as well. It's a cold weather crop. And so if you're growing lettuce in the, in the early season or the late fall, it's going to have a much better chance of growing to its true genetic potential because it's not suffering from heat stress and, and drought and things like that that it does not love. So nasturtiums, again, is a very hardy plant, so I would not use this as a very good example. But if you're growing something like a lettuce or a spinach or a tomato, don't grow it in the spring, grow it in the summer. Um, you have, you, there's a reason why there's summer crops and why there's spring crops and fall crops and things like that, because they do better in those times. So don't try to fight a losing battle and grow plants that grow well in that, uh, in that specific time of the year and you're going to be far better off as well. So there are some tips to getting your garden to grow to its full genetic potential and sometimes even six, uh, exceeding that genetic potential and giving you something that you're very pleased with. So uh, I am stoked about this plant. I mean, this thing is massive. So I'm really happy about it. And it's certainly um, something that I'm not complaining about. I come out here and look at it every single day and it seems to grow by, grow by the day. It's just absolutely massive. So I will catch y'all later. I hope y'all enjoyed. Hopefully you learned something new. If you did, give this video a thumbs up. That really helps me out. And uh, it's nice and sunny out. So I'm going to get out and uh, I think I'm going to go sit in the sun for a little bit and get some vitamin D. So I'll catch y'all later. This is Luke from the Am I Gardener channel reminding you to grow big or go home. I'll catch y'all later. See ya. Bye.